Hello everyone, and I'd just like to point out to you that after this video, which is the last in the series for now, I'll have a little bit of a studio chat and just tell you how I went about putting these videos together. I think you might find that of interest. In March 2019, a small group of us from California, Washington, Arizona, and Oklahoma drove the Mojave Road from Laughlin, Nevada to near Barstow, California. On the way out, I would stop at the Mesa Lands Dinosaur Museum and Natural Sciences Laboratory in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and at Anza Borrego Desert State Park in California. The Mojave Road is about 140 miles long, most of it crossing the Mojave National Preserve. We'd meet at the Avi Casino in Laughlin, and then depart the next morning for four days, three nights, on this fascinating and beautiful stretch of desert.
Another trip organized by Matt into the remarkable lands of southern Utah. Four friends in four overlanding rigs would explore some new areas as well as some old hangouts. On the way out, I'd stop at Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona and be fortunate to secure a permit to hike into Devil's Playground, one of only three a week that are issued. After our meetup in Big Water, we'd strike out across Grand Staircase Escalante. Crotton Road, Left Hand Collet Canyon, Hole in the Rock, the Burr Trail, and the Henry Mountains were on our itinerary. Due to heavy snow at the mountain passes, we'd modify our route to next take in Cathedral Valley Loop, then continue through Cottonwood Canyon, House Rock Road, and onto the north rim of Grand Canyon National Park. In all, seven days of overland travel through classic southwestern terrain.
seven and a half miles of the Burr Trail east of Capitol Reef National Park that you're seeing in these photos has been approved for paving by the BLM. This will leave only the section of this historic 67 mile route from Boulder to Bullfrog within the park itself unpaved. And local officials are intent on paving that as well.
It was a hot August in Oklahoma, and I hadn't been on an overlanding trip since April. I needed to get away, so I contacted my friend Travis, who lives in Colorado, and asked if he could whip up something interesting. And good friend that he is, he did. And that's how a brief exploration of Grand Mesa and the Compagre National Forest came to be. I would drive two lane back roads from Elk City, Oklahoma, to our meetup point in Delta, Colorado. On the way out, I would stop at the National Route 66 Museum in Elk City. In October 2019, Matt organized an adventure through the Gila National Forest of southwest New Mexico. This plan worked nicely with a trip to visit my folks in San Diego. So on the way to join the crew, I'd shoot some video and photos of interesting sites along the way. 
The overlanding adventure included two passes I had unsuccessfully attempted in the past due to deep snow, through Chloride Canyon and then over the Continental Divide, and Bursum Road across Silver Creek Divide, and then down to Mogollon. Five of us in four vehicles met at the National Radio Astronomy Very Large Array near Magdalena, New Mexico. The vehicle assortment was diverse, including a new Jeep Gladiator, a six-wheel drive Penscour, a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon, and my Wrangler. The planning was good, but I lost my water pump in Chloride Canyon and we spent precious hours repairing it in the field. We'd forfeit the planned Continental Divide crossing so the Magallon Endpoint could be maintained. Thank you. 
back to my studio. Let's go ahead and get started on this. The first thing I'd like to talk about is my choice of photos for the cutting room floor video series. This project involved reviewing approximately a quarter million photos that I've shot over the past eight years. When I'm shooting action, I set the camera I'm using to high speed multiple shots. It's quite easy for me to have a dozen shots of the same basic scene, though vehicles are moving, etc. So there are slight differences. In preparing these videos a few years ago, I was able to review my original images, those dozen or so high speed shots, against my final choice to edit. When I edit photos, I keep close track of the original image number. I could therefore select a different photo from this presentation. You might think you've seen a particular photo before, but it was a different one, shot perhaps within a fraction of a second of the other one. In order to make the photo appear unique, I'd crop it differently, usually closer since often in my videos I try to share the experience through the scenery we see rather than always cropping closely on the vehicle. Because I was cropping closer for an HD video instead of for a still photography album, I had the latitude to crop out more of the original image. For a still photo album, that could result in undesirable artifacts on the final image. But for an HD video, I knew the resolution of my final product was lower, so tighter cropping was practical. That gave opportunity to use even more of my original photos. Some photos required more time in editing. For me, spending more than two or three minutes editing a photo is quite unusual. Therefore, I'll discard photos that might involve too much work. However, for this project, I spent that extra time. We've all had plenty of it, huh? And sometimes I would do edits that exceed my usual boundaries, eliminating distracting elements to create a more pleasing image. Other problems that influenced my original selection of photos include vehicles with brake lights on. The photos look staged unless something else suggests movement, such as tires blurred from rotation. By the way, this is how I know you driver's automatic transmission vehicles don't downshift when it could be useful. I wait and wait and wait for your brake lights to go out when descending steep stretches to get the shot. Anyway, for this project, I did include photos of rigs with brake lights on. Another issue is dust. In my videos, I'll include just enough to show a stretch of trail was dusty. But there isn't much to see, so I don't use too much. This time, I included a few more of those dusty trail shots. You may also see shots similar to videos because in the past I may have chosen to not share a still if I used the video sequence. Also, there were a few shots that I really wanted to include, but they were never taken. So I ran the video sequence and grabbed a screen capture and now I'm sharing those. There are about 10 or so of those throughout the entire series, so it was pretty rare. I should also mention that my purpose of these videos was not to tell the story of the trip. That is what the original productions are for. This was a project to share a few images I thought some of my channel subscribers would enjoy while being stuck at home. Something to pass the time while perhaps generating a few ideas for future adventures. Along those lines, in this series I wanted to emphasize more a few of the things that differentiate overlanding from rock crawling or a weekend camping trip or a vacation. And that includes obviously the routes we choose. But your trip is more meaningful if you spend some time experiencing the culture and natural and human history of the region you're traveling. Have you ever met the mayor of Tulingua? Do you know what the first word sent by telegraph around the country was when the golden spike was set? Have you seen a golden eagle in a dramatic stoop to capture a prairie dog dinner? Have you ever eaten alligator in Louisiana or a donier in Northwest Territories? Can you tell the difference between a western and an eastern meadowlark, both by appearance and song? Have you ever pondered why it is that a pronghorn can run as fast as it does? This is a fascinating planet on which we live, and even if you never leave the lower 48 states, there is much to learn about different regions of the country. And for that reason, in this series, I included photos of places I visited during the drive to meetups for the actual overlanding adventure. Museums, parks, historical sites, and even rest stops are opportunities to learn more about the diversity of this incredible country. Take advantage of them and record what you learn. Document with photos, videos, audio recordings, annotated maps, or even a handwritten journal, or all of the above. And then organize and store and maybe share that material in some manner that would maintain your memories for posterity. Make your overlanding adventure more than just about driving and eating and camping. I should mention that if you turned on the subtitles, you may be impressed that I knew the names of all those dinosaurs. Well, to be honest, I did not. I have a habit that I'd recommend to anyone out traveling. 
If you see an interpretive sign, take a picture of it. They are filled with information, and even if you don't read it while you're standing in front of it, you can later revisit that sign to learn what it has to teach you. The same goes for placards that identify plants, animals, paintings, and so on. When I edit my photos, I save the edited version with information that identifies the event, month, and year, camera and image number, and a description. And those photos of signs and placards help me to record the information correctly, which eventually flows into the videos you see on my channel. But not everything has a sign, so I also use a small library of books to identify flora and fauna, as well as various internet resources. And if all else fails, I post it up in my video and ask if anyone can help. So if you happen to know what that bird at 557 in the 2018 video is, please tell me because it's driving me nuts that I haven't figured it out. And unlike most of the video, I can easily update the subtitles and update what's online. Speaking of which, I put a lot more detail in the later video subtitles than in the earlier ones. Since I can edit and update the online subtitles, I plan to do that for the earlier releases. Give me a few weeks to catch up on that if you'd like to learn more from those earlier videos. Anyway, I'd like to wrap this up. I expect some of you'd like to hear the rest of the story on the engine overheat problem that plagued me for almost two years. Well, it turns out it was my own fault. I modified the Wrangler so that I could turn off the engine fan when fording deep water. It turns out that the contacts on the relay I used for that had carbon buildup, likely from vibrating while current was passing through them. That vibration was caused by washboard roads, oh, in the cobblestone streets of Guthrie, Oklahoma. I replaced the defective relay with one that is hermetically sealed and mounted it such that the shock of rough trails would be reduced. Problem solved. Finally, what's next? Well, Death Valley canceled because of the world situation. I was hoping to get the eastern half of the tad underway, but have put that on hold. There is a trip later in the year I hope to make because it is a different part of the country for me to experience. I'll have to wait and see how the world's recovery goes before deciding on whether I can go or not. Without going into detail, suffice it to say that I have issues that are normally not a problem. But if I were to become sick with COVID-19, it could prove life-threatening. But now that I'm finished with these videos, I'm going to catch up on some moss for the Gladiator. Dual batteries and lights and a snorkel. And I was so impressed with Jim Rat's radio during the Big Ben trip that I have one of those to install in the Wrangler. And I have a couple other video ideas that I may work up, including one more, at least, of stills for the earlier years before I was seriously into overlanding. And that's it. Oh, except for one little thing. In one of these videos, I've placed an obvious Easter egg that may be a little difficult to see. If you think you've found it, if you aren't 100% positive, then you haven't found it. Let me know in the comments. Good day, then. Stay safe out there. And when you travel, do so lightly.